Hello, hi. Um, welcome to this. Um, I should probably explain that this was a interactive comedy show that I took to the Fringe uh, this year in August up at Edinburgh, and I'm now doing it here. Um, and I know it works at the Fringe. I don't know whether it's going to work here. So let's all go on an adventure together. Um, uh, I like to describe myself as a comedian who codes, um, mainly because it sounds a lot better than a so software engineer who pisses about too much. Um, <laughs> Also, you may be wondering, as my parents often do, whether I have a real job or not. Um, I do. I currently work at the BBC. Um, I work as a developer advocate in the day, but I'm not here to talk about any of that. I'm here to play video games with all of you. Um, hopefully, this should be good fun. And we're going to start off with a little bit of a warm-up game that I've put together, um, which is not Pong, but this is what Pong looks like. But we're not going to do that. Instead, uh, actually, before we, before we do that, just to get an idea of where who we have in the room. Can you give me a cheer if you played video games when you were a kid? Yeah. Yes. Give me a cheer if you still play video games? Yeah. Oh, my people. Yes, good. We'll be OK. Um, I played video games a lot when I was a child, um, but everyone told me not to. Uh, they said, don't do that. You'll be a loser. You'll grow up. You'll never have any friends, and you'll never have a girlfriend. Um, and they were right. <laughs> It's absolutely true. I'm in my mid-twenties, I've never had a girlfriend. That's absolutely true. Um, not that much of a big deal, though, because I am gay. So <laughs> They were right, but very much for the wrong reasons. Um, like a cryptic oracle in a Greek play. Um, you're sort of, oh, her son, will he grow up to be cool? No, he'll never have a girlfriend. <gasps> he'll be a total loser. No, he was gay the whole time. <laughs> it's the gay dance. Um, so we're going to start off with a sort of, a sort of game that we can all play. Um, give me a cheer if you've played Flappy Bird at all. A few people. Um, if you haven't played Flappy Bird, it's basically this game where there's a bird in the middle of a screen and it constantly falls downwards. It's normally on a phone and you tap the bird to make it go back up a little bit. You have to get through all these uh, sort of posts. This isn't a touch screen. Um, we didn't have the money in the budget for that. Uh, instead, the way we're going to play this is if you cheer, the bird will go up. And if you are quiet, the bird will fall down. So it's going to require some coordination from you all here. Um, the highest score I ever got in Edinburgh, which was a 30-day run, was nine. Um, so let's see if you guys can do a little bit better than that. Um, I'm just going to check that all the logic is working properly. Yeah, so high score of nine, cheering to make this work. So if you, uh, let's do a practice cheer. Three, two, one. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Okay, let's see how well you guys do. You're all, you know, a few of you play video games. Let's see how you get into it. So, three, two, oh, oh. Now cheer. Perfect. Good. Ooh. Good. That's one. You're okay. Ah, four. Oh, come on. Come on. You're a third of the way. Well done. Ooh. Ah, four pixels away from annihilation. Oh, come on. Five, four more. Good. Three. Oh! Don't say no. <laughs> you were so close. And then your own exclamation ruined you. Um, so well done. You were eight. Very, very close to the high score. Um, now, that was, we all played that cooperatively. That was quite nice. But um, that's not the real joy of video games. The real joy of video games is competing against your fellow human beings. Uh, so now I'm going to split you vaguely down the middle. Uh, you guys are going to be Team A, and all of you guys are going to be Team B. And we're going to see which one of you can beat that, or not beat it. We'll see how it goes. So we're going to start off with Team A, doing the same thing again, but I only want you guys to do it. So you guys have to be very quiet. Don't cheer sarcastically and make them lose, which happened a lot. <laughs> so I'm going to change the high score to eight, so the score to beat Team A is eight. Let's jump into it again. In three, two, oh, two, one, go! Good. Off to a good start. Learn from their mistakes. Come on. Ah, don't try and cheat. <laughs> good. Six more. Thread the needle, thread the needle, come on. Good. Two more. One more. OK. 
Okay, you're tied with yourselves. Come on, good. And it's a high score! Oh, how high can you go? How high can you go? Come on. Ah. This, this is the issue. Um, you weren't meant to get this far. Um, no. No. <laughs> That's not. <laughs> A little too good, <laughs> to be honest. Um, this is why you don't continue really times numbers by themselves, um, otherwise it goes. So, Team B. Um, just a little bit of a higher score to beat. Um, this, is, this might take a little bit longer than I first anticipated. Um, okay, so the score to beat is 121, um, which I believe is actually more than the entire sum of score we got in Edinburgh, um, but well done. Okay, Team B, are you ready? Oh, you're, you, you've already given up. You're like, oh, we cannot beat that such great score. Have some belief, come on. Um, okay, so 121 to beat. Um, I'm sure you can do that in half the time. Starting in three, two, one, go. Oh, go, go. There you go, okay. Now you could cheat if you wanted. I mean, you've already secured your title. Here we go, come on. Only 120 to go. You're playing a close game. <laughs> Come on. Good. You're fine now, but if it starts to close the gap. Good. Oh. oh! I mean, it was close. <laughs> it, was, it was very close. Give Team A a round of applause. <laughs> Now that one, that one, well, one half of you got that very well. Um, now we're going to try a slightly more difficult uh, version of that, uh, because all this talk really is is me giving you increasingly more difficult things to do for my own amusement. Um, so we're now going to play a version of this, uh, which is a little bit different. Um, the max score we got in this in Edinburgh was three. No one ever managed to get above three. To be fair, you beat the other score massively, so who knows how this is going to go. But this one, first of all, we're going to play it, uh, just sort of screw with your mind a little bit. And we're going to be playing this uh, in a term called inverted. Now, video games generally are controlled by things. And most normal people in the world, when they control the video game, when you press up, things go up. When you press down, things go down. But then some people in the world are insane. And when you press down, things go up. When you press up, things go down. These people are not to be trusted. <laughs> But we're now going to take an a, a journey into what their mind is like. And we're now going to be playing the same game, but now you make noise to go down and be quiet to go upwards. And to add an extra layer of difficulty, no cheering, I'm going to be strict on this, it's only clapping. This is a lot more difficult because trying to clap and create spikes of sound and average them out is a lot more difficult. But, and we're going to be doing this all together because on your own you won't be able to do it. So, clapping only, inverted, max score of three, um, the last seven times I've done this, they've got zero. Um, so I think you can beat that. Okay, clapping only, starting in three, two, two, one, go. Pretty good. Oh. 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 On par. Yeah, well, thank you. Actually, beat it. I did not expect that. <laughs> there we go. It's like we're at Wimbledon. Oh! 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 Almost. <laughs> yes! Oh! <laughs> well done! I would say give yourselves a round of applause, but you've 
you've used that. People looking at their hands going, why? Why did I do that? Also, my favorite thing about opening a show with this is people outside are like, what on earth is going on? <laughs> Swings from being incredibly agreeable to nothing at all. And then a weird bit in the middle where they were kind of politely amused. <laughs> That's good. So that's, that's the sort of opening show. This is one that I sort of made as a video game uh, just before Edinburgh because I thought it'd be good fun for a big room of people to play uh, together. But when I first started making video games, I realized really quickly, games are really complicated. Um, so I decided to sort of go back, uh, as you should do when you start any sort of new creative endeavor, and look back at the old masters um, and sort of see whether you can replicate what they've done. Uh, so this is Pong, as many of you will know. And we're now going to get into the section of the show where we play the video games with some controllers. I'm going to give you one first. I <laughs> hit Remy's face just went, oh, God, no. Um, and then I think we're going to start from the second row over here. And I can hear myself in the back of my own head, which is very creepy. Um, so this is uh, a version of Pong that I went back and remade. Um, you should be able to start moving them up and down in a second. Uh, you should be able to move the left stick up and down. There we go. Remy, you're the one on the left. You think. He just went, I don't know. Um, so this is my version of Pong. And I, I love these classic games. And this was sort of meant to be a game that, um, you know, it's like playing tennis. But it isn't very realistic. It doesn't really draw you in. It doesn't make you feel like you're actually playing tennis. It doesn't feel like you're actually at Wimbledon. So I went back and decided to make it a bit more realistic, to add a little bit more zhuzh to it. Um, so see if you can spot what I've changed uh, to make this just a little bit more of a realistic game of Pong as we jump in. Now, here we go. Oh. There we go. Oh. You can't be serious, oh. man. You cannot be serious! If I'm honest, I thought that would go on a bit longer. <laughs> it's always the trouble with these games. It's, some, it's trying to get the difficulty curve just right. One day in Edinburgh, we spent 10 minutes playing that game. They won for ages. They, they were just about to take it to the whole hour until one of them conceded. Um, but that, that was one that I sort of went back to and added some tennis sound effects. Um, there were more, but you spoiled it for yourselves. Um, another one I decided to go back to um, was Space Invaders. Um, I think, Remy, I'll keep you on this one. Um, this was another classic arcade game. You should be able to move left and, left and right. There you go. You should be able to press square to shoot as well. There we go. Um, and now I decided to go back to Space Invaders and make it, again, a bit more realistic. Um, because as we all know, um, aliens aren't real. So they're just not there. <laughs> so. It's a lot easier to program. <laughs> um, of course, there are some things in space, some human endeavors from human creation just sort of floating up around up there doing things. Did you just shoot the... <laughs> Remy just shot the International Space Station. All the astronauts, dead. It's always nice to know what kind of people really are. Stop shooting Peggy Whitson. <laughs> <laughs> See, much more realistic than the original. Um, but the, the reason why I wanted to go back to Space Invaders is because it's sort of um, in the video game Hall of Fame a little bit. Uh, this is the original one with the uh, Space Invaders up there. And the reason why it's sort of regarded quite well in the gaming community is because it's one of the very first video games that sort of had a difficulty curve. The idea that the longer you played it, the more difficult it became. So as you shot the aliens, they would start to move quicker and quicker because they would move left and right across the screen and move down a bit and left and right and left and right. And as you shot them, they would move quicker and quicker and quicker, getting harder to shoot. But the thing is, this was sort of lauded as a brilliant piece of game design at the time, but this is one of my favorite examples of the concept that I'm sure we're all far too familiar with, which is bugs as a feature. <laughs> because this was utterly unintentional. The only reason why this ended up happening was because when they shot the um, Space Invaders, the, the processor unit at the time just had less processes to do between renders. So it just moved quicker and quicker and quicker. And they went, oh, that's kind of good, that, and left it in the game. And then people were like, oh, how did you come up with this great idea? And they were like, oh, we're geniuses. <laughs> It's wonderful fun. I'm sure we know a lot about that. And this happens all the time in video games. There's things happening in them, and video game developers sort of writing them off as sort of coincidence or bugs. Uh, another big example is um, uh, in Tomb Raider. Uh, give me a cheer if you play Tomb Raider. Yes. Fake. I love you when, no, cheer. Um, <laughs> well done. Um, this is uh, from the first Tomb Raider um, uh, with Lara Croft. Uh, and one of the most controversial elements of this game is her very large, very polygonal breasts. Um, and they said, when asked about this, the video game developers said, oh, no, 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 that wasn't intentional. The only reason this happened was because we were meant to scale them by 50%, but we accidentally scaled them by 150%, which is either true, and they're terrible mathematicians, um, or it's just the most lazy kind of lie. <laughs> just, oh, we're not misogynist. It was a rounding error. <laughs> and also, it's incredibly lucky that 150% just made them larger and didn't turn them into three breasts. <laughs> Be weird. 
But my favorite video game bug of all time, because I think it's just the greatest thing ever, is in um, a game called Civilization. Give me a cheer if you've ever played a Civilization game. Yes, my people. Um, Civilization, if you haven't played it, it's a strategy game. It's a turn-based strategy game where you take a group of human beings from the dawn of civilization all the way through to the modern era and a little bit further on. When you play the game, you can pick uh, someone from history to play as. You can play as like Queen Victoria or George Washington or Genghis Khan. And then when you're playing the game, all the other characters that you didn't pick are in the game and you play against them. Um, and in the game is Gandhi. Um, you know, Gandhi. Um, I don't know why I say that like he's your mate. Um, <laughs> But, you know, Gandhi from down the road. Um, and in the game, they would model everyone's behavior to try and make them act like the person they actually were from history. And they had various different numbers for this. And for Gandhi, one of the numbers was aggressiveness. Uh, and for every single person in the game, had an aggressiveness value between 0 and 255. Uh, the reason being, it, they were using something called an unsigned 8-bit integer, um, which is basically how many numbers uh, that are positive can we fit with 8 bits, which is 256. But because you're 0, it goes to 255. And now Gandhi's value of aggressiveness was one. Now this would have been fine, but the problem is, is that later on in the game, around the modern era, around the diplomatic time, they'd reduce everyone's aggressiveness a little bit. Because they're like, oh, you're peaceful now, we should take it down a little bit. And that would normally be fine. If you're someone like Victoria with a low aggressiveness, with a medium aggressiveness, let's say 96, it can go down once to 95, that's totally okay. But if you're Gandhi, and you have an aggressiveness of one, it can go down once to zero, and that's totally fine. You're super not aggressive. But if it goes down again, <laughs> as I'm sure many of you are aware, the way that this works is it goes all the way back round, <laughs> and Gandhi becomes very aggressive. <laughs> right around the time that you discover nuclear missiles. <laughs> You'll be sitting there playing your nice game of civilization. You've been trading with Gandhi all game, and it's been going really nicely. He's been your neighbor. And then suddenly you see this missile flying across the horizon. <laughs> and your entire city goes boom. And they didn't change, you know, and it just sort of adds different layers to those old, you know, classic Gandhi quotes. Just, you know, be the change you wish to see in the world. <laughs> There's a lot more on, ominous behind it, that sort of thing. And weirdly, this was the part of the show that in Edinburgh no one believed. They said, this can't be real. So I've, uh, halfway through, I had to add in this screenshot. It was absolutely real. Greetings from M. Gandhi, ruler and king of the Indians. Our words are backed with nuclear weapons. <laughs> How brilliant is that? Um, and I like this especially because they kind of keep it in Civ games nowadays, and they've added a couple of rules for Gandhi to sort of stockpile nuclear weapons later on in the game. Um, and I love that that sort of led on to sort of affecting stuff. But I love these stories behind video games, sort of where they came from, their development, things like that. Uh, one of my favorite ones is uh, Tetris, uh, the original Tetris. It was developed in Russia, in the USSR, by this uh, computer programmer. And he made this game, and he thought it was really fun, and he, he wanted to sell it to people. So, Went to the government, and he was like, hey, can I sell this thing? And they were like, no, that's not what we're about. Um, and so instead, the only reason why we know of Tetris today is because a couple of uh, video game publishers from America flew over to Russia, uh, smuggled it out of the country, uh, and uh, published it themselves out of the goodness of their own heart and the depths of their capitalist greed. And this got me thinking a little bit. Like, is there a way that we could have gone back to Tetris, perhaps? Is there a way we could have gone back to Tetris and just make it a little bit more Marxist? a little bit more communist, something that they would have liked to sort of release. So I've gone back to the original Tetris, um, and I've remade it a little bit. Um, I think it's going to be your controller, Remy, but if you pass that to someone else who hasn't played yet, uh, we're going to jump in, someone who'd like to have a go. <laughs> I believe it's, this version's a lot easier. Go on, go on. I love that that's gone down three people going, oh, no, I couldn't possibly. <laughs> You can tell we're at a British conference. Um, so this is Tetris. Uh, it's going to be a sort of slightly different version. See if you can see what I've changed to make it a little bit more communist. Uh, you move left and right with the left analog stick. You press square to shoot it down quickly. Let's jump in to a little bit of Tetris. Here we go. There we go. Let's see if you can spot. Can you see what I've done? It's, we're all equal here. Um, and it's... it's it's double communist because we are, in fact, building a wall between us and West Tetris. Um, here we go. Um, and of course, the more lines you put down, the quicker it gets and the faster the USSR falls. Um, here we go, that's good. I think the highest score we ever got on this was 600. Oh, you misaligned one slightly there. Oh, oh! There's nothing like backseat Tetrising. There's an entire room of people going, I would be brilliant at it. Oh, no, give a round of applause. Oh. 
<laughs> now, if I'm honest, the reason why I didn't put any of the other Tetraminos in there is because I'm not a very good computer programmer. I didn't really have time to write in all the different Tetraminos because you've got to enter them all in, add all the shapes. So I'm going to need a, a little bit of a hand from you guys now. Where's the second controller? That one there. OK, you're going to be playing on the, the right-hand side. I think you should have another go at this. This one's much more fun. Um, so you're going to be playing on the right-hand side. Um, you're going to be playing Tetris as per normal on the left. You are going to be playing on the right-hand side where you will be building Tetraminos. You move the left analog stick up and down and left and right. You press X to select and triangle to submit to put it onto the sort of queue at the front. Now, you can play this however you want. You can be very kind and build really nice Tetraminos. You can build the classic ones or not. Um, people often choose the latter. No one has ever gotten a line in this game. I've done this 30 times. No one's ever managed to get a complete line ever. So if you do, that will be amazing. Let's jump in to a little bit of two-player Tetris. Here we go. So it starts off with some simple squares. There you go. You jump straight in with the diagonal. That's kind of cruel, but OK. Um, here we go. You can press triangle to rotate. Um, you can vaguely, again, you're just going for more triangle sort of things. You can deselect the central one as well if you want. Here we go. Good. It's a good pattern. That's building up better than, than most. Oh, here we go. Good. I mean, what even is that? What's that even meant to be? The T square is adopted. Another one as a friend. It's just. You're a, you're a cruel man. <laughs> Here we go, let's have a look. I'm just building more abstract. It is abstract art. Let's see what's going on. It's kind of building a face. It's kind of difficult to see with the lights. But it's, there we go. Ah, oh, no, what? You, you cruel fool. Give her a round of applause and screw you. <laughs> oh. That's, I, see, this is one of the things that I love about video games is that it reveals the real kind of person you truly are. Um, <laughs> Both this and civilization are these kind of games where you, and that's why I like video games, because there's this sort of moral space over there that we can visit and sort of examine who we are and what kind of stuff we do. Um, but there was one video game in particular growing up that um, sort of exemplified this for me, that sort of, and talking to other people showed like it was sort of this moral tool that people used while they were growing up. Um, give me a cheer if anyone's ever played The Sims. <laughs> yes. Now, if you haven't played The Sims, The Sims is a wonderful game. Um, it was developed by these lovely developers called Maxis, um, and it's basically this video game where you go and you make human beings, and you choose their flaws, their wants, their desires, and you build a little house for them. And then you send them to the bathroom, and you wash them, and you feed them, and you get them together a job and help them lead happy, fulfilled lives. Or at least that's what the developers intended. <laughs> that's not what we did with the game. Um, give me a cheer if you ever did anything mean to one of your Sims. <laughs> yes, our games didn't look like this, they looked like this. <laughs> With the maid going, oh, there's another fire, and the Grim Reaper's there to pick things up. This is my favorite thing, because usually a lot of people used to play it when they were a little bit too young to really understand that these are meant to be human beings and did horrific things to them. Um, like, give me a cheer if you did the swimming pool thing. <laughs> yes. Now, if you don't know what that is, um, first of all, well done on being a good person. Um, what it is, essentially, in The Sims, this was sort of the gateway drug to sort of murder. Um, is what you would do is you build a nice swimming pool in the garden for them, you'd put them all in the swimming pool, and you'd take away the stairs, and they couldn't get out. And then they would die. And we used to do this for fun. <laughs> Who says that Western culture is decadent? Um, and this, uh, no upper body strength sims can't get out of it at all. And uh, through doing this show, as I want to ask, like, what were the other things that people did to their sims that were, you know, kind of mean or cruel? And some people are geniuses. Like, um, there was this one person who, he had a bunch of Sims, and he didn't let them shower for, like, weeks on end. He deleted all the showers in the house, and then he built a maze. <laughs> and in the maze, he put four showers. And then he released the Sims into the maze. <laughs> and then when they would get to a shower, he would delete it. <laughs> and go back into the maze. Like, that's genius. Um, one that I found doubly cool was um, a lady who, she made a sim who was particularly OCD, particular sort of clean freak, and then would just slowly put dirty dishes around until she went mad. And I think that's doubly cruel because you gave her that floor. You are a cruel god. But my favorite one by far was a guy in the audience who, um, he wanted to do something very innocent, very innocent, is he wanted to make a church uh, for his sims to live in. Now the thing is, churches have graveyards. Now the thing, that is an ominous laugh. Um, <laughs> that is a laugh of recognition for where this is going. Now. They have graveyards, but the thing is, you can't buy gravestones in The Sims. You have to earn them <laughs> through death. So what he would do is he would ship in families into this place, pop them all in at all, murder them, and then pop the gravestones in the graveyard. And I just love this idea of this family moving into this house going, oh, this is a lovely conversion. It's very nice. With a swimming pool and a, and a graveyard. 
with all the same years of death. Hmm, interesting. And just going on. And then he eventually managed to build the graveyard and moved a priest in to complete it all, but the priest, the, but the priest went mad because the ghosts haunted him too much. It's always nice to have a story with a happy ending. Um, and recently I went uh, back to The Sims because I wanted to see if it's still like The Sims 1 that I played growing up. Um, to see whether you could still do the swimming pool thing. And you can, but they've changed it a little bit. Um, they've made it, you know, a little bit different. So I was playing this game, and now when I play The Sims, there's a lot going on in my head that isn't happening in the actual game. So there were these two guys, they were married, they were deeply in love. One of them was a secret mafia crime boss. <laughs> the other one was a writer. Neither of them knew. Um, I mean, well, the mafia guy knew that he was a writer, but the writer didn't know he was a mafia boss, it wouldn't work the other way around. Um, and in the mafia boss's career tract, you had to do certain tasks to progress. And one of them was to watch someone die, which first of all, is pretty dark for a PG game. And I was sort of thinking like, what's the best way to do this? You know, I want to succeed at the video game, so let's do this. You know, do I you know, go to a hospital and wait? Do I stand by the side of the road? And then I was like, no, the only thing to do is to have a pool party. So we invited the whole street round, wearing black tie, drinking martinis, having canapes. It was going fantastically. And then at some point, the host moves everyone out into the garden, look at the, the wonderful pool. Everyone jumps in. My guy's there in a tuxedo with a martini, looking particularly dashing. And then we take away the stairs. And it works very similar to the way it before, is you just sort of wait. But the thing that they've changed is how long it takes. So my guy was stood there, standing over them for five days. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a good time. Um, uh, but while doing this, I did discover something kind of useful, which is um, if you leave a sim on their own uh, and you don't give them any instructions, they become fully autonomous. They just go about their lives. They don't need us, apparently. And this has given me an idea for something that I tried just before Edinburgh, um, which is sort of a, like a, I like to think of it as sort of like a self-help method to sort of challenge yourself, kind of like a 5K um, or doing a triathlon or something. But this is much more difficult. This is something that I like to call the Sims Challenge. Um, and basically what this is, is um, you go into The Sims and you recreate yourself perfectly, identical to you with the same personality, same physical attributes, and then you leave it in a house, and then you leave it running for two months, and then you come back and see who's doing better in your lives. <laughs> it's, mu it's very difficult. So I did this um, just before The Fringe. First, I decided to recreate myself entirely accurately in The Sims. Um, <laughs> but then my producer was like, no, Joe, we have to do this properly. Um, <laughs> That's a room full of people going, yes. Um, and so I set him up in a sort of similar living place as I did, you know, in sort of a nice little flat. Um, and at first I was shocked by the accuracy of the simulation, that he was already behaving exactly as I would, just not going outside at all. And on the first evening, he'd already surpassed me at comedy, uh, being able to tell knock-knock jokes to other sins. Um, so I left him there for two months, and I went away, and then just before the fringe, I came back, and he's doing a little bit better than me now. <laughs> He switched from comedy to finance. There's more money in that. Who knew? Um, he's moved from my little flat into this horrific three-story nouveau riche monstrosity. Um, and now, while he may be doing, he may be thinner than me. He may be earning more money than me, living in a better house than me. The thing is, you can't program sexuality into The Sims. I can't tell him he's gay. So while he may be doing better in many more traditional senses, he is married with three children, living a lie. <laughs> so who's really winning there? <laughs> There is a sliver of hope. There's a sliver of hope. He does have a very good friend who only wears tank tops. <laughs> Maybe the only way to solve all of this is a quick family trip to the pool. <laughs> I don't know. Most of you went with it. There was a small pocket of ooh over there. Also, I would like to point out it's merely a coincidence that all the gingers are being murdered. Um, <laughs> that is not intentional. That was not a choice. Um, I would have tried to kill the toddler as well, but that's apparently where the line is in The Sims. And they can't, they're not allowed in the pool, so I'm just sort of sitting next to her going, soon. Um, also, I'm really quite disturbed at how playful my character currently is in the bottom left, <laughs> enjoying this process. But it's, that's why I love video games, is that they can be brilliant, wonderful places to sort of discover what kind of evil megalomaniac you are. Um, but video games aren't always great. They are, sometimes they can have things wrong with them. Uh, specifically, as an industry, there can always be a bit too many bugs. We talked about bugs as features before, but sometimes the quality can be a bit, a bit bad. Uh, like, this specifically was uh, a video game that came out a few years ago. This was a video game called Assassin's Creed Unity. Uh, probably a few people might have played it. Now, this was what Assassin's Creed Unity was meant to look like. This is what Assassin's Creed Unity actually looked like. <laughs> Just forgot to ship the face. But the, the place that the worst video games come out of is when films and video games collide. When uh, there's, specifically when there's a video game adaptation of a film. Does anyone know what the worst video game of all time is? Pizza 
the ET, the extraterrestrial for the Atari 2600. This is objectively the worst game in the world. Uh, in it, uh, you play ET. Um, there, just in case you couldn't tell. Um, <laughs> E.T. or a wheelchair with a head. Um, and basically, it's this little game based on the wonderful Siemens Spielberg film, and you have to try and get home and find your spaceship. Uh, so you sort of move around this sort of place, uh, and then you jump into these pits, and you go, oh, is there a spaceship there? And you go, no. And then you go back here, and you do that over and over again, and it eventually ends. Who knows why it didn't sell very well. Um, and apparently, it was, it was the, one of the worst failures ever. I, I don't know how true this is, because this was told to me by an audience member after a show. But apparently, they produced more versions of this game than there existed Atari 2600 consoles. <laughs> so already, even if it went brilliantly, they still have too many. And now, if you're a normal company, and you've made a product, and it's not sold well, you'd normally throw it away. Or you'd give it to charity, or you'd you know, do something with it, put it on sale. But apparently, and that's what most people assumed had happened, but there was this rumor going around, that instead of something sensible, that in the middle of the night, an Atari executive had driven out into the middle of the Mojave Desert in America and buried them all underground, which is a great story. And for this sort of existed for many, many years on online forums. But recently, a guy did a whole bunch of investigation, um, did a whole bunch of research, triangulated everything. And it turns out to be absolutely true. <laughs> And they found and they dug up this treasure trove of terrible games. Weirdly, now they're worth quite a lot of money. Um, and he, but the reason why I sort of bring this up is that um, that video game, even though it was atrocious, that took a long time to make, um, a, a very long time back then. But we live in a very different world now, um, a world specifically that has a lot more powerful technology, to the extent that I think, if I can find my mouse, oh, I'm going to move that down there, is that, say, one presenter and a few hundred computer programmers could create their own video game in a short amount of time. Uh, so we're going to have a go at creating a video game together where you guys are going to supply the artwork, I'm going to put it together, and then we're going to play it together, beat it, win it, all within the next mm, seven minutes. It's not, a real, it's not exciting if it's definitely sure it'll work. So we're going to jump into this and see if we can do this. So I'm going to be handing out this to have a go at uh, showing these things. So we're going to be doing an homage to Super Mario. I'm going to need you guys to supply the artwork, and then I'm going to put it together um, once this connects. There we go. So I think, I mean, I've already picked on you a lot, and you've played a lot of the video games. And you're nodding, saying, oh, so you're going to pick someone else. I'm not. Um, I think you're going to draw our hero of this video game, uh, the, the person who's, you know, ha is our player, the person who we're using. Um, you're going to have 30 seconds. You're going to have a nice little countdown music time. Um, where is my mouse? There it is. OK, so you have 30 seconds. You can draw whoever you want, starting now. Here we go. Let's jump in. Love, the con love with legs. The heart with legs. With terrifying arms. Here we go. With a face on it? That's lovely. He looks adorable. He's got a hat on. Oh, it's a... Normally, top hats are reserved for villains. You've got 10 seconds, and it's got... Oh, I'm getting tweets. Here we go. Um, what, are, what are those meant to be? A bicycle? <laughs> wow, they give her a round of applause. <laughs> so we've got this... Uh, We've got this sort of heart on a bicycle with a wand, uh, is our hero for this story. Uh, now, a hero needs a MacGuffin, something that they need, that they want to get. Does anyone want to draw, by the way? Does anyone desperately? Yes. Something that the hero wants, the hero needs, anything they need to get back that has been stolen from them. So, MacGuffin, you have 30 seconds, starting now. Here we go. Oh, you're using advanced, trying to pick a different brush. Oh. Yes. Oh, I don't. I actually don't know. I've never done that on this software. If anyone from Adobe is in, maybe we could learn. Here we go. So, it's a hat. It's a two hats. It's a pile of hats. Not just two hats, an entire pile. It's, it's amazing that, and that's the hat he currently has. Is the last hat he has. Just more top hats. Does he have any other hats, or is it just top hats? Here we go. Oh, oh, that's you're right. You're just out of time. Give a round of applause. So the hats are being taken. Now we need a villain, someone, the evil human being or any sort of being in the world who has done this. Does anyone else want to volunteer before I pick on someone? There, okay, you've, let's see how far the Wi-Fi works and whether this will work. Pass that along. And we need a villain, some horrible hat-stealing bastard who's taken our heart's hat away. Uh, you have 30 seconds starting now. Here we go, come on. What is it? Here we go. It is. Please don't draw a penis. Please don't. In Edinburgh, it was just penises. Um, no, it's a slug. It's fine. It's a slug of some kind. Are you going to draw a dick butt? Is that, is that what's happening now? 
I come to a conference of web developers. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> I don't know what I expected really. Give him a belated round of applause. <laughs> Oh, the attention to detail is horrifying. Um, so now we need a henchman, some sort of enemy, lower down enemy who can help our boss out. Does anyone want to volunteer? Does anyone have any artistic want? Or oh, there were, were there hands at the way at the back? No, someone just vaguely waving. I'm going to pick on y you. Yes, because I know you, and you're saying like, no, 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 it can be anything at all. Okay, to say, go on, evil top hat. Just draw a top hat. It'll be amazing. <laughs> someone will have to draw. We have 30 seconds starting now. You can draw anything at all. There we go, Katie's doing it. Okay. Again, everyone wants to use their own colors. Everyone wants to be very specific. Um, are we going for an evil? What are we going for? Is, are you going to do Sonic? Is Sonic the villain? No, no, not quite. Here we go. That's, what? 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 <laughs> go. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I, honestly, these have been the best ones I've ever gotten for this show. Um, so now I'm going to be putting these together with the video game. I'm um, doing some coding. Um, there's a lot of theater involved in this, so just go with it. Um, so I'm going to need some help from you guys. Yes. Um, specifically, uh, some help to avoid some bugs. Because we've had a couple of bugs today. You've seen how bugs uh, can behave in video games. And you all, I'm sure, know about bugs in your day-to-day -day jobs. Uh, but I was wondering if you could help me test uh, this new debugger um, I've invented. Um, it takes the natural form of, uh, of bugs, like this, uh, and you have to destroy them. This is what uh, software bugs actually look like, by the way. Um, Chrome sort of hides it away. And the way this is going to work is you guys are going to have to cheer like you did with Flappy Bird, except this time you cheer to shoot. And I can only really start the video game once all of them are gone. So if you cheer, there you go. Jump in and try and get rid of them. Goodbye, debugger. Thanks for having me testing out that debugger. 
which is now making noise when I talk. There we go. Now we're going to play uh, this video game in a sort of similar way. And I thought we'd end on something a little bit co-op, a little bit, ooh. Where is it? That just go? Oh, it's down here. That's fine. There we go. Good. OK, so I thought we'd end on something a little bit co-op. We're going to play this game together. I'm going to be moving left and right. You guys are going to cheer to jump. And we're going to see whether we can get to the end of this and get our hats back to our wonderful hearted player. So if we jump into it now, here we go. There's the person. So if you cheer. Oh, let's do some live debugging. Player. Oh, come on. Wait. Why is that not working? Oh, there we go. Oh, go on. Okay, I don't have much time. Oh. Oh, oh! My bad, I'm very sorry. Here we go, okay. Oh! That was poor hitboxes, there we go. Okay. Oh! Let's just jump over him. Oh! Okay, wait one second. Oh. Okay, now try cheering. Cheer! Oh! I don't know what happened, but oh! Oh, I know what that is. I accidentally changed the wrong variable. I changed the lateral, the lateral velocity, not the gravity. Um, jump, full saddle jump, there we go, 200. Now try cheering. Oh! Keep cheering! We need to get over this jump. Here we go. Oh! Ah! Close! Here we go, come on. Oh! Our villain, the giant dipper. <laughs> okay, let's try and land on him. Yes! And we should be able to get our hats back. Where have we gone? There we are. Oh, wait, quiet. Quiet. There we go. And that was the show, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Um, these lovely people worked on it. Um, I presented and wrote it, Jed directed it. Liam Weber made the wonderful music you're hearing now. Um, if you like that, um, I do more things like this a lot. Uh, at Joe Hart, the dick part is flying around. That's where you are in. Um, FF Golf, you've been absolutely lovely. I've been Joe Hart. Goodbye!